Hello and welcome to Rusty Water Towers, the podcast in search of faith and hope in rural life and ministry. I'm your host, Jonathan Lemastersmith, or as folks like to call me, Dr. J. Most of the podcast episodes I, I host, I talk with a guest about their experiences in rural life and ministry as we search out the stories, examples, and images of creative faith and hope uh, that I believe are latent in rural communities. However, today's episode is the holiday episode where we take some Christmas traditions and unpack where they came from, what they mean, and how we might use them to continue to nurture hope in our rural spaces. Some of these traditions we engage today are mistletoe and kissing balls, Christmas caroling and Christmas boogering, and maybe some Christmas foods. We'll focus on rural realities with these, as is our usual move, and if I have stories, I'll share. But first, as always, let's take a talk about a country song. It's Christmas, of course, and I want to talk about a Christmas song. Lori McKenna continually releases songs that move me to memories I didn't know I had. Her song, Christmas Without Crying, does just that. Some of the lyrics read, My mother's in a polyester coat. I'm smiling so hard my eyes are closed. Her hand is on my shoulder. It's snowing outside. Someone took all the old pictures out and were laughing and passing them around, sitting on the couch. Big pin on the back, she wrote, 1975. The days of the wish book catalog. Christmas is one of those holidays that we build on. Memory is built on the foundations of traditions and experiences. I don't care if it's a song you heard on a Kmart commercial 10 years ago, the old ornaments you forgot you had, or a certain kind of candy you thought had been discontinued. Christmas is an emotion-laden holiday. It's not a bad thing, but as the song will remind us, as we get older, you can't make it through Christmas without crying. A mix of grief and joy and memory and hope settle around us. We have to let people know we're fine, mostly, but it's still something we have to remember will happen. The song assures us that you can sing all of the Sunday hymns because you've known the words all your life. You can roll past that out of high school and smile all the glory days long gone by. But you'll remember being 11 when you're stringing up those lights. And that will be why you can't make it through Christmas without crying. Like always, I'll add this to our Rusty Water Towers playlist on Spotify. Now, let's jump into our traditions. So on Facebook a few weeks ago, I asked for y'all, and y'all voted that I should cover a few Christmas traditions you weren't sure about, and that's what I did. I did the research, and I'm adding some of my own as they emerged as part of the conversation. And because I'm a good researcher, I'll cite my sources as the researcher uh, in the show notes. And unless it's a story I've heard, then I'll just give the name of the person uh, as part of that, because any kind of research is going to be a mix of doing the Googling and the and the diving into newspaper articles and those sort of things, as well as just t- playing with the stories I've heard as part of this. And as a special treat, if you remember, I want to encourage you to wait until after the credits for one more surprise tradition that you might want to look into for, your, for you this Christmas. So to get us started, we're going to look at weird decorations people ask me to talk about. First up is mistletoe. Mistletoe is literally a semi-parasitic plant that often place often attaches itself to the top branches of trees. And people were figuring out how that happened. There are a couple ways it happens. One is that it as bird eats birds eat their seeds, they pass through their bodies and are just pooped out onto the tree and uh, attached there with part as a sticky substance on the shell. And if the bird can't get the whole all the seeds down. They're often attached to its beak, so it will scratch its beak on the side of the tree as well. And so it's a parasitic plant. It's got pretty white berries uh, and usually grows at the tops of trees. You can ba- really tell it, especially in wintertime, when all the leaves have fallen off the trees, but there's bunches of greenery at the top that doesn't make any sense. The mistletoe tradition holds that one person can guess another uh, who is standing beneath the sprig or a, a sprig of mistletoe, or a bouquet of mistletoe. If a kiss is refused, bad luck befalls the person who said no. The mistletoe became a sacred, a sacred symbol for the Druids, which inhabited the British Isles, uh, as well as other parts of Northern Europe during the time of the Romans. Uh, it became a symbol of vivacity and fertility uh, when they saw it blooming in harsh winters. And it became actually central to many of their rituals that Christianity would, of course, take over. There's another story that goes along with mistletoe that seems to come from Norse mythology, that the mistletoe plant was a sign of love and peace. The story goes that the goddess Fig lost her son, the god Baldur, to an arrow made of mistletoe. After his death, she vowed that mistletoe would kiss anyone who passed beneath so long as it was never again used as a weapon. Of course, mistletoe makes its way to English and American traditions. It starts out really in working class, silly traditions of parties and those sort of things, but it 
eventually makes its way up the ladder into other different uh, classes and becomes a common holiday tradition. Although I don't see it as much anymore, but uh, it's still present. And in rural areas, particularly in the South, the traditional way to harvest mistletoe is with a 12-gauge shotgun. I first encountered mistletoe when I was in college at Pfeiffer University, and we didn't shoot it down that day, but we admired how much it had overtaken the trees and talked about that uh, practice of shooting down this semi-parasitic plant. So what we know about the semi-parasitic plant is that while it will will take on and uh, attach itself to trees and take nutrients from them, it does not kill the tree. I think this would be a great family tradition or community tradition to go and shoot down mistletoe and give out mistletoe to people as an act of love. I think uh, anything where we can go and actually kind of, you know, uh, harvest uh native plants in order native plants and and even invasive plants to utilize in decorations as opposed to buying more and more plastic is uh quite possibly a great idea another tradition like this is the tradition of the kissing ball i have just encountered uh kissing balls for the first time this year it came from i have one and it came from helms christmas tree farm in vale north carolina the kissing ball or bow comes from the Middle Ages, and during this time, villagers would often wind together twine with evergreen branches in a sort of a, in, in a ball shape. In the center of this ball of evergreens and twine and other things, they would often stick a clay infant that represented the baby Jesus, because Christians are very good at just putting Jesus wherever they want him to go. Uh, and these holy bows or balls or bows would often hang from the ceiling along passageways and castles and big houses, render blessings and good luck to all who pass under the holy infant. So it's a tradition designed to represent evergreen eternal life, but also to passing under the infant who offers us eternal life, and that brought good luck and blessings as part of that. In Victorian England, uh, these kissing bows were refurbished. It was decorated with herbs and foliage in an elaborate manner. It often, uh, instead of a Jesus statue, it was a, a piece of fruit was in the middle, was used as a place to hold everything in, whether it's apple, pear, those sort of things, and fruit would also be around it. And they would use plants such as bay and pine and flowers and herbs that meant something symbolically, or flowers or that would provide good smells into the home during the holiday season. And like I said, it was often used, a piece of fruit was often used in the middle, uh, or a potato would be used in the base. I don't believe there's a baby Jesus or a piece of fruit in mine. I think it's actually just a piece, a ball of floral foam. But nevertheless, it's beautiful, hangs outside my, outside my house, and reminds me of the good people at the Christmas tree farm. So next we're going to jump into um, Christmas caroling and other traditions of visiting. I, country people love visiting. They expect their pastors to go visit. They like to go visit each other. So we're going to start with two different traditions that eventually have led to visiting and seeing people. And the first is caroling. Back in the days of the feudal lords, medieval times, the peasants who lived under the nobles' protection but didn't know the land they worked, they had often had very hard lives, and it became a tradition for them to go and sing carols outside the Lord's house, the Lord being the person who's in charge of the property, not the church, and receive hot cups of wassail or other and food in exchange. But as time goes on, it turns into a group of rowdy peasants going and harassing the wealthy landowners in order to get money, food, and certain things out of them, because it often believes that the wealthy landowners were abusing the people. Uh, and not paying them fair wages. And in fact, eventually wealthy landowners would pool their money and hire security teams to protect their property from roving bands of carolers. So it makes you think of the carol, We Wish You a Merry Christmas. And we, you know, we've got the nice, the nice verses, the We Wish You a Merry Christmas, Good Tidings We Bring, those sort of things. But then there's also the two verses, Now bring us some figgy pudding, now bring us some figgy pudding, now bring us some figgy pudding, now bring some right here. And then... There's, we won't go until we get some, we won't go until we get some, we won't go until we get some, so bring it right here. It, that's kind of a threat. It's a real thing. It's a, we're not leaving until you give us food, basically. We're not, until you give us what we are due. Now, as Christmas caroling has emerged in the 20th and 21st century, it's become more of a pleasant experience, mostly sharing songs with people. Maybe you take them treats, or the people, the homeowners often give out treats if they're expecting them. Uh, many of our rural communities will often send carolers to the homes of the elderly, the sick, and those in assisted and skilled care facilities, hoping to bring joy and engage with people during the dark and cold times of the year. Oftentimes, they would get in cars and drive around with Christmas lights as part of it as well. But caroling and singing tends to be fading away in many spaces, and people will say they just don't have time or they're not good singers and don't want to go do it. This is particularly true in the U.S. While public singing to, and uh, communal singing is very common in Europe, many Americans rarely sing in public. 
and even in spaces like churches, karaoke bars, or carol groups where it's expected. Singing feels like people will only sing if they are a trained and good singer. They feel like they would be judged for it otherwise, even though they're just there to make a joyful noise and spend time singing the Christmas carols we have. So as we think about this tradition, uh, we I think about the 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 need for visiting. And we're going to get to another visiting one in a minute, but I think about rural spaces and the need for people to connect with one another and the need for front porch sitting and the need for going around and talking to people and engaging with people to go and especially with the shut-ins and the elderly who don't get out a lot who just want to have a conversation. And me as a pastor, I try hard to do that, but oftentimes different things get in the way and I can't get to everybody every week. So one of those things is coming up with ways for people in your community to visit one another in ways that isn't threatening, isn't preparing a full meal, is a way for them to engage. Maybe even taking them gifts. I think, of course, of the mistletoe. Mistletoe and the Christmas balls are just really, uh, kissing balls are really just ways to share, to share love and joy. Uh, you have this sense of, uh, of excitement, the symbols of evergreens that hanging outside people's homes, wreaths, garlands, trees, of course, I'll do that. But I think of the silly ones like the, the kissing ball, and the mistletoe as ways of connecting with people uh, that utilize these old traditions and that we may talk about ways to talk about spreading love and joy and hope in these spaces by reclaiming traditions, utilizing what we have instead of leaning into a consumer-oriented Christmas, and being silly with little statues of Jesus, because why not? Let's, I mean, we need to have some joy in our Christmas tradition most of the time anyway, so so why not roll into it? And speaking of weird joy in Christmas traditions, I have stumbled upon a really interesting one. It's called Christmas Boogering. So if you Google this, you're going to get a lot of a gross little children's book and other and other depictions of this. But I learned from a church member named Jerry, because I wrote a, wrote a church newsletter about Halloween, that there was a tradition called Christmas Boogering that people would go from house to house dressed up as spooky characters uh, whether at Christmas or Halloween or otherwise, maybe you just saved your Halloween costume over, and you would go from house to house during the 12 days of Christmas, some knocked on doors, and if you were welcome in, you would be there to sing silly songs, tell jokes, put on skits, while people tried to guess who you were. It's another reason to have fun, go out visiting, and get get snacks and food from people, or share snacks and food with people. It's sort of, it's likely grew out of the European Christmas tradition of mummering, but good country folk went from mummering to boogering because boogers are the things that live out in the woods that might come and get you. It's alongside of Halloween boogering, trick-or-treating. And like I said, it's people like to visit. But as people get more and more standoffish and uh, visitation continues to fade, it also seems to point out, and I found a couple articles in local newspapers about it, seems to point out that it begins to fade away whenever we get more and more... Uh, media in our homes, the radio, the television, the internet, all of these things sort of, and the telephone, all sort of began to cause visitation to fade. People will say, you know, it makes them anxious to go visit. It makes them, uh, we're too busy I don't, or I don't want people coming to my house. It's not, it's not what, it's not set for people. Visiting is a gift for everyone. Take, just take time. Pick two or three people in your community who could really just use a good 15, 20 minute visit. Uh, if you have the urge, you know, take them a treat bag, a bag of candy, uh, take them a small gift. If, oh, if it's a shut in your church, you know, I picked up the church bulletin for you. If it's someone in your community who just needs a visit, they're not members of a church or anything like that, just check in with them. Don't don't be creepy. I mean, unless you're doing the Christmas boogering tradition. I think this Christmas, Halloween Christmas boogering, Las Posadas, where you're going around knocking on people's doors, which is a Mexican Latin American tradition where you're knocking on doors and asking for a place for, the, for Mary and Joseph to stay. And there's never room so that people leave their houses until you end up at a big house or a party or the church or somewhere like that. These sort of visitations and community gatherings are so important and some, are something that we can reclaim because they cost little to nothing. And there are ways to get people together that isn't just a formal worship service or a Bible study. It's a fellowship event that allows for people to connect. So now that I've had visiting traditions and decorating traditions, I'm going to talk about my favorite thing, talking about Christmas foods. There's a lot of different Christmas foods we could talk about. In fact, one person dumped a whole bunch of Swedish and Norwegian Christmas dishes on there and I love y'all, but no, I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole of looking into traditions, uh, Swedish Christmas traditions. Uh, those are wonderful, but I'm really more rural U.S. I, I thank you for your suggestions, though. Instead, we're going to focus on two. One is the holiday fruitcake, and one is the holiday treat bag. Holiday fruitcake. 
It's an old tradition. Not just because we have a lot of them that just sit around for decades. It's an old, old tradition. It's a high calorie, high energy food content, a dense cake that has fruits and nuts and spices in it. Has a long shelf life and, and easy to easy and compact to carry. It's so important that Roman soldiers would carry it because it gave them the, the nutrients they needed to get by. Now, of course, Roman soldiers were several thousand years ago, and we have a different sense of understanding of this, and that thinks of the modern American fruit cake. It's similar. The fruit, of course, was candied to provide shelf life. So, to the cherries, the pineapples. Food you didn't get year-round because you couldn't go to the grocery store year-round to get food. You grew it or you got it in a shipment and you did things to candy it, to preserve it. That's why we do cure meats. You, you, um, you, dry, you dry fruit, you dry vegetables, you preserve them. You do the things to make them last long. And then you also would mix in some a little bit of the spices you had to celebrate. You had a little bit, you wanted to share abundance with that. That's part of that. It felt a little nicer, a little fancier. If you put the spices in there, it wasn't just sugar. And sometimes there'd be cinnamon, cloves, allspice, but it may be other spices that they gathered from their local area because we have spice bush, we have service berry, we have all of these forageable things, pine needles. Some, some pine trees, Google which ones are edible. Don't go out and eat pine needles because I told you to. Acorns, uh, pecans, any kind of nut that you're, a, you're able to eat could easily be cooked into that. And then, of course, these had a really long shelf life, partially because of the candied fruits and nuts, but also because, being good Americans, we seasoned our fruitcakes, which is just code for soaking it or brushing it booze with booze. A harder liquor, like a brandy or a rum. In the South, it's bourbons is often the drink of choice, or Tennessee whiskey, something like that. But you do it for at least three months, and they will have a much longer shelf life and a much richer flavor. As part of that. And you might have some experiences with it. The tradition, so this tradition, whether or not you like fruitcake, I like fruitcake, comes from the need to preserve food, but also celebrate the holidays. If you get a dense amount of calories and the most, uh, and get the most out of your spices, it's great for gifts, great for chunks to be sorted up because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a gift that you had to eat immediately. You could eat it over time. Now, usually fruitcake doesn't last in my house, whether it's store-bought or purchased. And I actually make a fruitcake cookie from uh, Trisha Yearwood's recipe, if you're a fan of Trisha Yearwood's cooking show. It's dense, again, and it's but easily more easily transferable, and it's not as much. You know, any food like this is about sharing in abundance and making the most of what you have. I, I have this dream one day of writing a book or an article on making the most with the food you have. Potato salad, chicken salad, any of those salads utilizes mayonnaise or another dressing to make potatoes or chicken or cheese or whatever that may not be the best cut of whatever that is or the best freshest of whatever that is, making it last longer by adding the dressing, the mustard, the pickle, the vinegar, the spices to cover up maybe the uh, less appealing flavor in order to make it last longer and go further as part of that. Finally, I want to talk about one more tradition. It's a mostly, from what I can tell, Appalachian tradition. And I remember this tradition, in fact. And it's uh, churches giving out Christmas treat bags. The churches I pastor still do it, as do several others in our area. The Christmas treat bag is usually given out following a Christmas play or another special service. And children receive these bags. And they were often a brown paper bag or another colored paper bag. There may be decorations on it but it had treats in it. In some places and in some times, these were likely the only gifts children and people would get. They usually included an orange, an apple, maybe some other fruit, like a pear, depending on what you had, a candy cane, some gum, packs of gum, and some chocolates. Yeah, I've also seen, you know, with the red and the yellow apple. I've also seen it with nuts. I've also seen it with other homemade treats. Nuts, very popular for this are, of course, pecans, English walnuts, Brazil nuts, Peanuts, things that you see even in the grocery stores now that you are, are not, that you say, well, I can buy nuts any time of year, but then there's gift baskets of nuts and fruit as part of that because, you know, you didn't always, we live in a world now where I can get asparagus and strawberries and oranges any time of year because they're in season somewhere in the world that we will ship them. But even just 50 years ago, it was much harder to get fresh produce all the time. We live in a global world that allows for us to move things back and forth. But in a time where fruits and nuts were much rarer uh, if they weren't in season and they were ways to share good a sweetness that were affordable, 
it was something you could do. And I still think it's a great tradition because fruit, nuts, candy, chocolates, great. I've also seen a tradition where they have the more hollow peppermint sticks and not candy canes. So then you can cut off, after you squeeze up your orange and get all the pulp mixed up. You, I'm making hand gestures like you can see me squeezing an orange. And you would cut a slice in it and stick that uh, peppermint stick down there so you could suck the juice up through it and you get like a weird orange peppermint flavor as part of that. I still love those hard candy sticks. Although I don't remember the last time I stuck a, a, a peppermint stick. That was one of the first memories my wife and I bonded over in terms of Christmas tradition. And now while, like I said, originally they were given for children, most of the churches give them out to whoever wants. It's a way of acting out of abundance with seasonal fruits and treats. And I think this one, uh, mixed with all of the others, of course, feels like the one where it's about pooling our resources for the church to be able to buy gifts uh, so that s at least somebody gets everything. It's it's And it's a simple gift. You don't. I think of Christmas and we, we get so commercialized, even in the rural spaces that I serve, it's the, it's the treats we want. It's the simple decoration. And especially being in rural places that are more connected land, why not go out and harvest mistletoe and pine branches and do those sort of things? Why not utilize the baby Jesus out of the nativity scene and put him in the kissing bottle until Christmas Day? Why not, you know, kiss somebody on the cheek underneath, uh, underneath the mistletoe? Why not live into a world where we go around visiting just because people want to be visited? Taking small gifts or just your presence. Dressing up if you want to, singing carols, you know, why not a February carol? Sing, sing love songs to people for Valentine's Day, sing Easter carols, whatever. Just go and be with people and, then the tr and live into these traditions in ways that foster hope and community. I think one of the realities we continue to see in rural communities is people continue to get more and more disconnected from tradition, from each other, and from the place. We still see people trying to maintain these things, but when you get disconnected from the rural traditions and culture, you get sort of a disconnected of, I don't know how to operate with the traditions my grandparents had, and I don't know how to be in community the way they did. Now, I'm not saying you have to copy and paste, and I'm never going to say you have to copy and paste anything, but you have the opportunity to take these traditions and relaunch them in ways that offer hope. Sure, we're not going to have the same sort of treats always that we had, and yes, I can get apples year-round. But a simple treat bag with some fruit in it, given out to people. Uh, uh, going around singing Christmas songs, because you're going to sing them in your car anyway. Add going to look at Christmas lights. Go out to eat afterwards. Have a fellowship meal. Do something with it. The fruit cakes. Again, it's just sharing and utilizing what you have, making do with what you have, learning how to utilize it, and then celebrating that tradition, and even making it a place to be celebrated. I think of having cookie exchanges or doing uh, fruitcake challenges, things like that. Enjoy them. Have fun with that and live into that because you're disconnecting from that tradition, disconnecting from other people. The visiting really helps with that. We have seen a, a surge in deaths of despair, deaths of loneliness, overdoses because people feel disconnected from community and will turn to self-medication when they feel disconnected, whether that's alcohol, drugs, media, or just feeling a sense of isolation and, and just disconnecting and fading away. Well, we, so making sure people are connected and visited. If we often, well, I'm, I meant to, I always meant to, and that's a reality. I said, just said that earlier as a pastor, I mean to get to everybody, but it gets harder. And that's one of those realities that we need to live into of how do we make sure everybody in the community is part of the community. And then finally, a disconnection from place. I, I regularly see this is that a lot of urban people assume rural people are all naturalists who can wander out into their backyards and the fields and be like, you can eat that, but you don't eat that. And you use that for this and you use that for that. And, you know, the deer like that, but then uh, the squirrels like that. And then you can take this, this thing and you soak it for two days and you get the tannins out and you can eat it. I'm describing acorns there, depending on depending on that, knowing which acorns to eat and which nuts and all that sort of, we, they assume we have this deep place knowledge that is just not the case for many rural people anymore. It may not have been for a lot of people. So again, relearning those traditions of pulling from the evergreens to make decorations. I mean, there's uh, to bring in sense of those learning the different trees that white pine has swirls of five needles with blue and orange that, you know, red cedar has is actually a, a, a juniper tree, not a cedar tree. You get all of these sort of things and learning which ones you can eat, those sort of things, but also just being able to go out and harvest mistletoe, cut down a Christmas tree, those sort of things uh, as part of that. So there you have it, several Christmas traditions that I wanted to go over. And 
uh, if you have comments on these or think about these, feel free to, to feel free to reach out. One last thing, I always ask my guests to bring a share a piece of media, song, movie, podcast, whatever let's listen to that give them hope right now. So I'm going to do the same. I thought about bringing some poetry that I've been reading. But instead, I'm talking about two songs. I am often accused of only listening to country music. And while I do listen to a lot of country music, I teach it. I lift it up here. I see it as sort of this bold reality of rural life that we can use. I listen to a lot of different music. And I want to prove it. Well, at least the first song. So this song is called Light, M25 edition by Grasscut, an EDM electronic dance music band uh, group, I guess you would call them, that I heard on a Kmart commercial 10 years ago, and it has stuck with me ever since. It gives me a sense of, of a mix of nostalgia and possibility. It's got this beat that shifts a little bit, that's got a sense of pulsating, a sense of, but it also seems to be because I guess it was attached to a Kmart commercial, because it's got this repetitive thing, because it came out at Christmas time, it has a nostalgia to it, but it also offers a possibility. The lyrics are simple, it's very dance music. The lights that light, the lights, oh, the lyrics, it's, it goes and it just repeats itself. The lights that light, the lights, the lights, the lights that light, the lights, the lights that light, the light, the lights, the lights. And there's the days that fade, the days that fade away. And it goes on to the way, and it leads into the way and talking about the ways we turn away, the ways we, the ways that make the way. And all of these, when you think about them, could be just gibberish words. But for me, it seems to speak to a reality of possibility. That light makes light. Light doesn't extinguish other light. It spreads light. Look, I drive around looking at Christmas lights as a child. These people put up lights and they bring light to us. And then it leads into days and ways and all of these sort of things as part of that. So as I think about it, I think of this EDM dance song that I love. And I've been listening to like lo-fi beats and EDM and sort of, sort of things lately to help me get through grading. As well as to process some sort of sense of being present at Christmas, I sit with it. Now my second one is a more traditional Christmas song. It's A Little Town of Bethlehem. This song has been following me around this year. It keeps like creeping up in me. It's another song about light. Uh, a Little Town of Beth Bethlehem speaks to hope in a rural place because it reminds us that Jesus was born in a little town. He was born in a stable. Shab shepherds nearby came to find him. This is a little kid, a baby, born in uh, to a family trying to get by, find a place to sleep in a small town. The light of Christ came into the world in a rural space. Now, my favorite verse is, I believe, the third verse. It reads, How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. It's a reminder that just because things are silent, things feel quiet, especially at night in the winter, especially at nights around Christmas when everyone's home. Something's still happening. The gift it's given. And we're present with it and trying to figure out what it means. It's not a big boom. It's not a dramatic light show, although the lights are pretty. It's something that sneaks in and offers us a chance to think about who we are, how we connect with the divine, and what hope we have for the future in our communities. I thank you for listening to this episode of Rusty Water Towers. You can listen to Rusty Water Towers wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions, suggestions for guest topics, or just want to say hi, you can reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or you can email us at rustywatertowers at gmail.com. Special thanks to Shandela Mastersmith for our theme music. I record and produce this podcast because of my desire to lift up the hope and faith of rural life. <laughs> Live across the railroad tracks in a little lighthouse. Must you pass if you weren't trying to find me? Many of the trees are dead, there's stumps in the ground. In a great big yard across from the fire station. Oh, oh. oh. All right.
so if you stayed around, I've got one more Christmas tradition from you. One of our former guests sent this to me when I posted about it. It is the the Kaganer. Uh, it is a it is a, a a character that you can add to a nativity scene. So nativity scenes have been around for centuries. You know, almost as early as the circulation of the nativity story, images of it began to pop up. And around the world, they have different depictions. Different characters may be present. Different depictions of those characters may be there. Usually, there's at least the core group, which are Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And oftentimes, there are other traditional characters that are present. The shepherds, the wise men, the animals, the angels. Oftentimes, it is depicted in a barn with you know, a little fake hay or Spanish moss to look like hay. Sphagnum moss sometimes. However, in some traditions, other characters may be placed there. You know, such as the saints, images of family members, political leaders, to be sort of a prayer to direct people towards those who are towards the message of the nativity. Now, of course, we know an occasional children's toy ends up there accidentally or on purpose, uh, or lots of other different ways to, could happen. But the, the Kaganer is funny. It originates in Catalonia, Spain, and it's the image of a person pooping defecating in the nativity scene. Not in terms of like on the baby Jesus or Mary Joseph, but it's a character you add to the corner to see if people notice. It's a bit of a whimsical character. And if you Google it, y'all, if y'all Google this, you can find all sorts of characters. The first one that came out was Bert of Bert and Ernie of Sesame Street. I saw every political figure, Queen of England, every president we've had recently, all sorts of things, different characters, some generic ones, looks like you could add pictures to them, those sort of things. And it just, it's, I feel like it would be such a fun and silly tradition to move around as part of that, to have a little character that when you go visit people in one of the other ones, or you get people small gifts, you can add this little character to it, just they can add, to, or you can sneak it into their nativity scene at their house as a silly gesture. Don't do it weird and maliciously. Let people know that it might happen. Or to give it to them as a silly thing to pass on. Sort of a pass it on sort of gag gift you give out to people. That brings a little silliness to, uh, to the tradition. Not to be disrespectful, of course, of the Holy Family. But to live into that it's a weird tradition that, uh, that we lift up. And all of our traditions are weird and funny and quirky. So why not pick one where we add other characters. Whether it's a man pooping or Bert from Bert and Ernie there. Whatever. So thanks y'all for staying till the end. Have a great have a great holiday. Mm -hmm.